At first, I would like to thank the organizer for having such an interesting session. When I saw the title, I just thought, oh, I've got to be there, definitely. Um, not especially because I come from Belgium, well, but uh, yeah, Belgium is a small country, but we've got at least chocolate, beer, and Henri Perrin, of course. So. Uh, but because my research topic is really focusing on glass from this particular period. So as we already said, as we have, we have already heard, uh, the early Middle Ages is really a period of deep changes. This period experienced modification in power, as well as the growing supremacy of the <coughs> Christian faith that went with the foundation of many churches and abbeys. Next to them, Emporia also emerged on the coast of the North Sea, and the previous Merovingian agglomeration seemed to be transformed. Indeed, the production activities disappeared from this site, and as proved by the work of Joachim Enning, during the Carolingian time, uh, most of the, of, of the goods, most of the artisan production were made in abbeys or in the rural area and especially in places controlled by the aristocracy. What's also interesting to notice is that the movement of craft production from the previous agglomeration to uh, the rural land goes along with technical changes in this craft. And one of the most emblematic is certainly the one that glass production went through with this change of fluxin agent from soda to potash glass. This change is now documented in two sites from the end of the, the 8th century, Paderborn and the monastery of bon le monsieur By using a material that was available in northwestern Europe, glassmakers were first able, were, were able to reorganize the whole production and were able to produce primary glass in northwestern Europe and so to have a primary glass production at the same place as the production of the object and then they put an end to their dependency to the oriental production. However, the mechanisms leading to this change are not well totally understood, and next to the shortage in natron, the increasing need for architectural glass across Europe could have stimulated this innovation. Indeed, <coughs> glass discovery has raised in the recent year emphasizing its importance in early medieval architecture. At the end of the 7th century, churches had real stained glass window and the walls could have been covered with mosaic. Next to painting <coughs> and stone, glass played a role in the transmission and the reflection of the light. And in that regard, the colored glass was certainly also an important aspect of the decoration. If window glass is among the first to experience a modification in the recipes, tessere uh, are going to stay in the Roman tradition and they will long be made with natron glass. This certainly uh, imply different production technique and certainly different production workshop. If remains of secondary production no workshop have been discovered among Europe, these testify production mainly of blown glass, so vessel glass or window glass. But there is no evidence of poured glass used for the tessera production. We've got no workshop producing this small cube. And even on a broader scale in the Byzantine Empire, there is no known production of tessera. So how did the artisans obtain their raw material and how did they organize the supply and the diffusion of the cubes? That remains a question. For the early Middle Ages, Lise James, the specialist of medieval mosaic, emphasizes that the fifth and the sixth centuries appear as a high point in mosaic making, <coughs> at least in Greece, in Italy, and in the Byzantine Empire. Then the number of new mosaic decrease from the 7th century again in the 8th century. The 9th century appears as a resurgence for mosaic making. But for northwestern Europe, the site of Germinie de Pré, 
Do you see? Yeah. Is the only one with a mosaic from the early Middle Ages. Still, there must have been much more mosaic in this uh, region because we more and more find these small cubes next to churches, and not only the glass cubes, but also remains of mortar where the, the cubes were inserted. We also have written evidence describing <coughs> mosaic, for example, La Dorade in Toulouse, those of Cologne or uh, Paris. But even with this example, mosaic and tesserae are definitely typical of the Byzantine art and are also widely spread in Italy. So most of the time, Byzantine and Italian artists are mentioned as responsible for the mosaic of the north, and the material is also supposed to come from Italy or the Byzantine Empire. Still, on a technical point of view, nothing can exclude a production in Northwestern Europe. And we dedicated a workshop, workshop to this subject, and we hope to publish the proceeding by the end of the year. I'm looking at the editors. <laughs> For the period considered, the glass tesserae correspond to very small fragments of glass. They are generally small, smaller than one centimeter square and uh, uh, lighter than one gram of glass. The glass tesserae were mainly meant to, de to uh, decorate the walls of the churches. Uh, they were made of opaque or translucent glass of various colors. You can have uh, blue, red, green, like a wide range of color. But you can also have a uh, tesserae covered with uh, metal foil, mainly gold, sometimes silver. For this tesserae, there is a glass base that is mainly colorless, but that can also be colored <laughs> mainly in brown or red. Then a very thin leaf of metal, generally uh, thinner than a few micrometers. And the leaf of metal is protected <coughs> by a very thin sheet of blown glass. These, be, uh, these, sorry, these tesserae are mainly discovered in two types of sites, uh, mainly places linked to <coughs> early churches and to the elites and also in palaces. And then, as we've seen previously, they are also found uh, in workshop, where they were meant to be remelted and transformed in other objects. During postdoctoral fellowships, I had the great chance to study several sets of uh, tesserae coming from two main areas, one over here and one in the center of France. And these tesserae from uh, Maastricht, Toulouse, Tavlo, Liège, Macon, Autun, Never, and Germany de Pré were at first studied with macroscopic observation and then analyzed when it was possible in laboratory. Therefore, we use PCPG method, but also uh, microprobe analysis and a la ICPMS, some of you ca can recognize, and Andreas Kronz from University of Göttingen. When it was possible, we analyzed the, the, the different parts of the tesserae too. So not only the glass, but also the gold, because it can be relevant according to the work of Elisabeth Aneri and Marco Verita. Finally, we did some uh, portable XRF analysis <coughs> on the site of Germini de Pré, directly <coughs> in situ, because if some of the cube were detached from the vault, uh, we couldn't sample, unfortunately, <laughs> on the others. <coughs> now, if we look at the results, first for uh, the colored glass, according to the work of uh, Nadine Skibile or Shibile, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, colored glass is a very specialized production. And what she could show for the site, at least for the site of Sagalassus, is that the colored tesserae had a, a, a glass composition that was typical from the primary glass production and then at opacifying and coloring, coloring agent typical from a secondary workshop. That's for the Roman period. Now, in the early Middle Ages, the picture becomes much more fuzzy. And in our set of data, we could identify for the same color of tessera different recipes. 
in the same region, but also on the same site, for example, at Germany des Prés. So we've got several options. Of course, the mosaists could have uh, get their cubes from several workshops, supposing that these workshops were always working with the same material and with the <coughs> same recipes. Then it's also possible, possible that due to the recycling, one workshop had several recipes. And finally, there is the recycling and the reuse of previous uh, cube, mainly Roman cube. Of course, these three options could have been mixed on a random way. If we consider recycling, uh, we are going at, to look at the opacifying agent and with mainly two types of options. Either we've got an antimony-based opacifier, I've got, either we've got a tin-based opacifier. In Northwestern Europe, uh, we considered that antimony-based opac opacifier is typical from the Roman production. And then from the fourth century, it is going to be replaced by tin-based opacifier that is used for the Merovingian beads as for the decoration of Merovingian vessels. In here, we've got a lot of cubes uh, that are opacified with antimony, uh, mainly for the white cubes, the yellow cubes, and the cobalt blue cubes. So these are certainly coming from Roman reuse, Roman recycling. No. Looking at the gold foiled tessera, we are going to have a quite different picture. In the set that we studied, we have mainly two types of golden tesserae. These brownish tesserae and these blue-green tesserae. These are chemically totally different, not only because of the manganese that was added in order to get the brown color, but also because of the sand. This set of brownish tesserae was made with a scent that is totally different from the, from the blue-green blue tesserae. It is shown by the trace coming from the sand. It is also shown by uh, the traces coming from the recycling. And these tesserae are those of the site of Never, that is, they, they are dated more or less from the 6th century. No, the blue-green cube are dated from the 7th century and beyond, and they've got a quite homogeneous composition. In these blue-green cubes, the traces uh, of recycling are quite high, if you look at copper, lead, cobalt, zinc, and so on. And this is revealing clearly a reuse, a remelting of all the glass. Now we distinguish the two parts of the tesserae, and the glass used for the base is different from the glass used to cover the tesserae. The glass from the cartelina is indeed much more clean than the glass of the base. And apparently, they selected very cautiously a, a clean glass in order to have a translucent, a transparent sheet. Even if this glass also contained traces of recycling, such as antimony. But antimony was not avoided for the cartelina as a the other coloring element. <coughs> Now we also have got in this glass a lot of uh, manganese, and at what one portion it was clearly added in order to have this colorless glass. Let's have a quick look at the gold. This is not really the subject of the workshop, but still it's interesting. And we are going to see when we were able to analyze the gold because it's very, very thin. We are going to see that we've got different composition. The, the gold of Never is clearly different from the other uh, sheets of, go uh, of gold, because it holds a lot of copper. Then the glass of Germini des Prés, uh, the gold, sorry, of Germini des Prés contained a lot of silver, and the sheets are also thicker, about four, four micrometers, while the other sheets are uh, more thin than one micrometer. And so we've got small differences between the sets. So for the, for the gold foil the tesserae, if we consider the different part of the glass, we are going to see that we've got different cluster. The one of Nova is clearly different. Then we can dis distinguish the production <coughs> of Germini de Pré with the gold foil. And if we look at the composition of the cartelina, we are going to see that some of cartelina are made with a very uncolored glass and some are not. 
So finally, we've got very distinct group for the gold folded tessellate. Now let's try to make some kind of conclusion about the tessellate production and the, the glass production uh, generally. <coughs> at first, if we look at the composition of the colorless glass, we are going to see that for the sixth century, we still have an import of fresh glass. We have got very few traces of recycling and the composition of the tessellate from Neva seems to fit with the Egypt II group. For the blue-green tessere, we've got a composition that we just discussed with uh, Ines Pacta, and that seems typical from the HIMT glass, but with a lot of recycling. Mm -hmm. So clearly, recycling is increasing. Now, what's it, what is interesting to notice is that uh, some of the makers of the tessere were able to add manganese in order to get colorless cartelina, and the manganese is not used anymore for the production of glass window and glass vessel, at least in the glass from Northwestern Europe that I could analyze. So these tessera makers certainly had access to other type of material and they can also have access to the gold. If we look at the different set, we see that we've got no real match between the different uh, group of tessera and we couldn't find a perfect match with the tessera from Italy or from, from the Byzantine world. So this tessere, at least in the state of the art, seems to be particular production may be made on demand for a particular churches. And in the 14th century, for example, the tessere, the golden tessere from, from Orvieto were made on the site, especially for the church. No reuse and recycling of tessere Definite, was definitely practiced. We've got the evidence on several sites. We also have got the evidence in written sources, such as a letter uh, from the Pope Adrian allowing to Charlemagne to take the material, including the tessere, from the palace of Theodoric in order to decorate his own church uh, in Aachen. These tessere are also found in ship, and it's proven by the analysis that they were reused. They were reused in order to create new mosaic, and they were also reused to make new objects. And with a quantity of about one gram of colored glass, these could have been valuable material, especially for some colors. Because some colors, and we discussed that about uh, the cobalt blue beads yesterday, some colors seem quite difficult to obtain, at least in some region and for some period. It's the case of cobalt blue glass. Uh, in the recipes of the monk Theophilus, cobalt blue glass, at least cobalt blue windows, are supposed to be made from Roman tessere. He clearly writes that the, these tessere were remelted in order to obtain the windows, and up until now, the analysis seems to prove that. Now, considering the huge amount of cobalt blue glass that we've got for the medieval period, can we really see that as only resting on recycling? Well, that's a question that we certainly have got to discuss. And then there are other colors that seem difficult to obtain, for example, uh, the, the yellow and the white. Uh, in the set, uh, in the Byzantine Empire, uh, Liz James noticed that the white glass was replaced by stone. And in our set of data, the white and yellow uh, tesserae are very, really rare and mainly resting on, rec on recycling. No, there were a lot, quite a lot, I think, of yellow beads and white glass was also quite common in that type of material. And at least for some of the beads, uh, glass makers, beads makers, were using a byproduct of metallurgy. So it's quite surprising that the tessere, the people in charge of the tessere, ignored these recipes. And one can wonder what were the exchanges between the artisans in charge of the glass, but also between uh, the different artisans working with pirate technology. So that's also, uh, I think, an, an important point to consider this cross-craft interaction. Some of the artisans may be being closer according to the purpose of the object that they were making. Again, it's a question that we would like to raise uh, with the uh, Rural Riches project. 
In conclusion, to come back to my title and my first question, I would say that tesserae are not the result of only local production or only import. There were certainly several leads in order to obtain the material, in order to obtain the cubes. And these options would have varied according to the region and the time, of course, but also to the consumers, to the, to the person ordering the tesserae and the mosaic. But definitely, glass appears as a thing that travels and that will allow us to picture tangible exchanges with the material, but also through the recipes and the techniques, the exchanges of ideas and knowledges. Thanks for your attention.